it's not often that I have the opportunity to come up and speak in almost a free-form fashion about anything that's on my mind. So that's, I, I reflected a bit on what I wanted to talk about and being older than most of you, perhaps that gives me the opportunity to reflect on um, some lessons that I've learned along the way. When I first joined my first company, it was a machine tool company, I was there about a year and I had the opportunity to take a job as a quality circles facilitator. This was the mid-1970s and my company decided that we were going to use quality circles, um, which was actually very common among U.S. companies, did it all the time. There was a management fad, we read it in a magazine, we ought to do it, let's try it. So I became the quality circles facilitator, which were an extraction of a larger quality movement that were going on in Japan at the time. The quality circles movement at my company failed miserably, but it launched from my perspective a lifelong journey personally in thinking about and studying the journey toward optimization, what this thing means. So all I want to do this morning, hopefully in the next 15 minutes, is say something that you may be able to walk away with as a lesson. Uh, my colleagues here have so much confidence that I'm going to say something inspirational that none of them are here listening. So they said they heard enough at dinner last night, they didn't want to listen to me anymore. Um, and by the way, I, I, I'm really grateful to James and to Duncan for the reception last night. It was really, it was great super for networking. And if there's any doubt in your mind that 3D printing adds value to the economy, think of how many people expensed dinner last night and ate it at your stand, okay? All that fell to the bottom line of a lot of companies here, I think, in the last 24 hours. So I'm a quality circle facilitator and I start reading about optimization. What does optimization mean in the manufacturing world? And I read Schoenberger and Lean Manufacturing, and I read Eli Goldrod and The Goal and The Theory of Constraints. And I had the opportunity to travel for many, many years. Um, I had the chance to go to Toyota, to the original facility where the Toyota production system was installed. It was awe-inspiring. I was in the home of the Toyota production system and I was talking to the plant manager who had implemented it 15 years before, and I said to him, I was with a group of six people, and I said to him, sir, what does it feel like to lead the leanest plant on the planet? I mean, and he said to me, I get asked that question all the time. We just completed our annual planning cycle for the next year, which was 1995 or something. And he said, we as a, a plant have determined that we have a 30% improvement opportunity this year in productivity. In the leanest plant on the planet. Wow. I had a chance to go down to Brazil. I was at a truck factory in Brazil. And I'm walking around with the plant manager, Luis Caravallo. And he had implemented all these lean practices. Um, every machine tool that came into his plant, they tore out the panel on the electrical box door and they put in glass. You know, hundreds of machines. So I said to him, why would you put glass? You tear out the panel, first thing you do is you put in glass. And he said, every machine tool in here has indicator lights that are in the electrical box. When something's wrong, you have to see the lights. So the first thing you have to do when something's wrong is you have to turn the machine off and open the door to look at the indicator lights. So we put glass in so our maintenance guys can see the lights without shutting the machines off to open the door. Wow, pretty smart. Every, every motor on every machine they had in their plant had a little fan on it, you know, a little plastic fan. I said, why, why, is the, why are the fans on the motors? He says, maintenance guys drive around. If they don't see the fans turning, something's wrong with the motor. They know to fix it. So I have all these data points in my head about optimization. So let's think about what does optimization mean in the manufacturing world? How do we define it? 
What would Dr. Ono have said? Well, it's making exactly what you want, exactly where you want it, exactly when you want it, and exactly the configuration you want it with no waste, no time loss, precisely deliver what you need the moment you need it. That's optimization. Right? And I, and I, I, th I accept that as a premise. And actually it's fascinating because two of us in a row are talking about manufacturing. I mean, I appreciate Scott bringing this up, but it's kind of amazing because a couple of years ago I went to a lot of 3D printing conferences and nobody said very much about manufacturing. We talked about a lot of other stuff, you know. And quite honestly, I don't know much about what most companies do here. Um, I'm not even sure what a prosumer is, and I'm not sure I could even spell ecosystem, but because everything X1 does is about industrial production. So we think about this thing called optimization. What is it? Exactly what you want, where you want it, when you want it, how you want it. And I reflect back on where manufacturing was when I started in the 70s, and manufacturing worldwide was pretty awful, truly. I mean, if you looked at the metrics by which we would measure the manufacturing world, productivity, quality, on-time delivery, around the world, not that great, okay? But to manufacturing credit, it went on a forced march over decades to strive towards something. So what are, what are we striving for? We're striving for this, this almost unrealizable goal of true optimization. So what happened along the way? Well, we invented programmable logic controllers to put on machines. And then we invented CNC controls. And then we invented factory automation. We invented robotics. We digitized engineering. Um, we instituted lean practices. We focused on supply chain management. We, um, we came up with Six Sigma quality systems. Every one of those took manufacturing where it was and took it up a step, right? It took it a step farther along this journey toward optimization. The lowest possible cost, exactly what you want, when you want it. So, I'm in this world my whole life and suddenly I find myself involved with a 3D printing company. And I read all the same things that Scott was referring to. You know, it's changing the world, it's revolutionary, it's disruptive, it's, it's, it's all those things. And you know what? I don't buy most of it. I don't. Because I've had now a many decade journey of observing this march toward optimization. So what do I think about 3D printing? I see it as a logical extension of this same journey. Um, you know, I was very fortunate when I worked for my first company because the company was already 120 years old when I, when I joined it. And it was 140 years old when I left it. And I had a, one of my first bosses was a, the plant manager there who was actually, uh, he was an infantry commander in World War II. And um, he ran the plant that way, by the way. And I was terrified of him, but he was, he was an amazing guy. And he'd been there 40 years. And I, I was there a couple of years and he said, he said, well, I'm gonna be retiring. And I was like, oh my God, you're gonna be retiring. I mean, he was this iconic person, everything revolved around him. And I said, what are we gonna do as a company when you retire? And he said, you know what, Dave? He said, I'm gonna be gone three months and you guys aren't even gonna remember I was here. And I said, that's not possible. And he was gone about six months and nobody even talked about him anymore. But what he said to me after that is he said, look, he said, this company is 130 years old. We are simply links in a chain. The chain connects the past with the future and we're links in that chain. So I am a link between what was and what's going to be and that was my role here and, and my time as the link has ended, it's time for the next links to be connected. And I thought about that and I said, you know what, this whole manufacturing journey is the same thing. It's a decades, centuries long journey toward optimization. 
And from my perspective, 3D printing isn't revolutionary. It's not remaking the world. It's not changing everything as we know of. It's a link in a chain. It creates the opportunity for the manufacturing world, which by the way is very, very important to all of us, it creates the opportunity for the manufacturing world to take its next step in this very long journey toward optimization. You know, a journey that I think is critically important. So, if it's anything I've learned in the last several years working with X1, it's precisely that. Do I think that over time, 3D printing is going to play a very significant role in the manufacturing world? Without a doubt. I've been around metalworking my whole life, and I understand what it takes to make a factory run every day. I understand the quality requirements. I understand the, the productivity requirements. I, requ I understand the on-time delivery requirements that a factory manager cares about. Because if we went down the road here to any high production factory and you said to the guy running the place, do you care about 3D printing? He'd show you his wall and he'd say, I care about cost, I care about quality, I care about on-time delivery. That's what I measure, okay? The extent to which 3D printing helps me with that, I love it. The extent to which it doesn't help me with that, I don't care about it. And, and I agree with that because that's, that's his world. So over the long run, is 3D printing going to help us to, as factory managers, run a factory which achieves those goals? Absolutely. Positively, without a doubt. One of the, one of the criticisms of 3D printing today is that, in fact, it doesn't immediately help all that. It's probably true. The question, though, we have to ask ourselves is not where are we today with 3D printing relative to traditional processes, it's where can 3D printing take us? Because my view of the optimization process, all the tools we have available to today that we've deployed, we are beginning to find the top of the arc in terms of our performance improvement capabilities. 3D printing gives us a chance to raise the arc to the next level to take us one step closer to this vision that we somehow have in our heads that what we want to do is make exactly what we want, when we want it, how we want it, where we want it, no waste, low cost. Um, so I think where this all fits from my perspective, and again, talking about a company that only focuses on industrial 3D printing, this gives us the chance to be the next link in the chain, to take us the next step closer to this uh, optimization um, sort of vision that we have always had for manufacturing. Um, now, from the perspective of most people here, does, does any of this really matter? I, I don't know. Um, I can't address that. I do know from the perspective of the guy with those three charts on a wall, it matters a lot because he's worried about, for his shareholders, how to give more value tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And 3D printing in the industrial environment absolutely gives us that opportunity. Scott touched on many, many of the, of the benefits of 3D printing in the industrial environment. There's no need to review them. You know them, okay? The ability to create better parts, truly better parts. We see it every day at X1. The ability to take designs that have never been built before because we couldn't build them and build them and build them effectively. We're doing it every day. Um, so it's a very, very powerful force from my perspective in the advancement of worldwide manufacturing. One of the really interesting things I learned along the way, and I, I didn't really understand this because I travel a lot, I've been to a lot of different countries, and manufacturing has a common language. Even though the people who are involved in it don't speak the same language. So you can walk into a Korean factory, you can walk into a Brazilian factory, you can walk into a Spanish factory, and you may not be able to actually understand the words that you're speaking to each other, but yet what happens on the factory floor is an absolutely common language. And almost simultaneously worldwide, it is advancing at the same rate everywhere because we speak the same language. 
So what's the language? It's the language of optimization. Um, so, not to belabor the point, but to simply say this. I believe strongly that the manufacturing economy around the world is the engine that drives wealth creation. Those who execute it the best create the most wealth for whatever region they're in. Given that it is the economic engine and we depend upon its improvement and vitality to help drive the entire world forward in terms of increasing the standard of living for everybody, what are our choices in terms of what we deploy to make that engine go? Um, I'm hard pressed as a manufacturing professional to look any of you in the eye and say, there is a better answer than what we're doing here. Um, I've been around manufacturing technology my whole life and I will tell you that the deployable assets we have to try to drive that engine forward are beginning to taper. But we now have an almost unique opportunity to deploy a whole new fuel to power that engine. And if we deploy it well, that engine has almost limitless potential to take us to that place which is called what you want, when you want it, where you want it, how you want it that whole definition. So I'm only going to close with this thought. And again, it probably echoes something that, that Scott said. Um, we, I've had the, the pleasure now twice in 2013 of going on the road to sell stock to investors. And um, it entails you create a nice presentation, you sit in offices and you talk and you talk and they answer you a lot of questions about blah, 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 blah. Um, and I had, I was sitting in, uh, in one investor's office a couple weeks ago and I had talked and talked and I was running out of things to say to try to help him see what I was talking about and we were just, we were just not connecting here at all intellectually about what was going on. And he finally said, look, I don't get it. I don't get this whole 3D printing thing, okay? I read a little bit about it. Everybody's making a big deal about it, but I don't see any evidence that it's changing anything. And I said, well, let me, let me put it to you this way. I said, 3D printing is sort of like a tsunami. I said, a tsunami is a little bump on the ocean until it hits the shore. And I said, 3D printing in industrial manufacturing is the same thing, okay? It may look like a little bump in the ocean, but when it hits the shore, it's going to be a really, really, really big deal. So thank you for your attention this morning, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.